at 17 habitat types, but you loosely group the ca into three general categories, north, central, south delta, because of the consolidated common characteristics within those regions. Right. I, I think you ought to explain that because that is in some way uh, fundamental to how you've analyzed the issue right. and probably is more direct related to what we're trying to do in the delta plan Yes. Than, than anything else. How did you move from 17 habitat types and develop three cons three regions for purposes of analysis and discussion? Yeah, so it was a lot of, you know, as, as we were doing the mapping, starting to recognize um, both the patterns of how, you know, just visually looking at how, how the relative proportion and how, how different habitats fit next to one another um, within the landscape. So we started seeing that, that shift across the landscape. Um, and then also understanding, as we started to understand, I'll move on to the, the next slide here. Um, actually, I won't. Um, but starting to recognize how... Um, in addition, the processes, the, so the flooding versus the tides, and that started to help separate it, separate out the general areas. Um, we couldn't go about, you know, you can't define a single line, a border between between these landscapes. But starting to recognize the patterns, and I, I have, I think, two slides uh, down the road. I have, I show that proportion, and, and I think that'll speak to your question a little bit more. Um, so first, to, to set up um, these major gradients in the landscape that, that really helped us, again, define what these major landscape, primary landscape types um, might be, um, it's important to recognize the underlying physical gradients across which these patterns are expressed. So kind of at the fundamental level, um, obviously there are lots of physical gradients in the system, but at the fundamental level, we have the gradient between brackish and fresh fresh water at the delta mouth. Obviously, that shifted depending on the time of year and also the, the, sea, the, sea, or the year itself. Um, and then we have the gradient um, from tidal to um, non-tidal as you move upstream in the system. So those are gradients over which you, the you, habitats you, are expressed. You use, in, in your three chapters, you say, the central delta where tides dominate. That's the caption you use on a series of slides. And, and I think that comes... If I can understand the categories, that will help me understand where you are. So central delta is where tides dominate, and then the uh, north delta is where flood basins flank the rivers, mm -hmm. and the south delta is where flood basins uh, uh, meet tides, if I recall plans. correctly. Okay. okay. Hammer those three points, please before you go into the details of each of them, because okay. I think it's important to understand why you chose to make those distinctions. Yeah, yeah. So, again, um, I'll, I'll flip through to this slide, which I think is probably the, the one that captures that difference. Um, so as I, as I was saying, with that, um, with those gradients, with the, the title really being um, moving from fresh or brackish to fresh, right at that kind of where Sherman Island is, where that transition occurred, um, into the central delta where, where tides are dominating, um, you can see with the pie charts here that we have um, – with, based on the proportion of, of our habitat types, you can see that you have a much greater proportion of tidal freshwater wetland than you do in the other landscapes um, that we've defined. Um, and then in comparing the north and south delta, you can see with the north delta, you have a much more riparian forest. Um, you have a greater area of, of lakes um, within the, the basins of the north delta. And then with the south delta, you have more non-tidal um, freshwater emergent wetland, so these perennial wetlands. Um, and so you can see the, the, that the proportion of habitat types have shift depending on where you are, between, depending on which landscape you're in. And then also, um, as I said, the, the processes that underlie them, of course, in, in terms of um, the tides versus floods in, in the north and south. Could I just ask a question? Just Did you also take into account your upstream gradients, though, because if you have lakes, typically they're going to be replenished and they're not driven by underground sources that not just in the wet season, but did you look at kind of your climatological approach that if you had all those wetlands that you're going to have more moisture into the air so you might have more summer rains and you'd have free-flowing creeks and streams and rivers so that would continue throughout the summer when necessarily maybe the major watersheds would diminish but you'd have 
Did you look at that? Um, certainly, just in, in terms of framing the, the north versus south, the, yeah. the climate was an important factor in kind of it, certainly in the in the fact in the fact that in the north delta we see um, that it was much wetter. Um, in comparison to the South Delta, you have more kind of patches of, of seasonal wetlands in the South Delta. Um, was, it, was it wetter because there was a, a, a different, say, a microclimate? I mean, again, I'm not a scientist. I'm way out of my league here. But I'm just I'm curious, was there, you had all that area of, of, of water, and say open water, but, you know, and so you're going to get, you know, off what, of that. One, one of the big insights, yeah. I think, and Allison's going to get to this, but just to okay. answer your question right away, I think, is it the North Delta naturally stored a lot of the flow. You see that a little in the Yolo Bypass today, but it was much more than that. So all these lakes and those flood basins, as Phil mentioned, they were natural flood storage areas. So they're capturing all of this water that then is being stored and distributed back into the lower delta through the course of the summer. So there are all these quotes historically about, you know, the delta was was fresher because of that kind of lateral storage area. You know, we have reservoirs up in the mountains. We used to have reservoirs right around the edge of the delta that delivered water directly into it throughout the summer. So and it's a pretty interesting approach. And perhaps more importantly, um, too, um, in, in uh, speaking about the climate, is, is actually the groundwater. That might have been a, a more important factor in terms of keeping things wet, that we had really high groundwater tables. And, and so that's right. um, another reason why, why you... It would be being recharged through those floodplains and flood basins. Okay. Great. So um, let's see here. Yeah. So as I was as I was saying, um, it's not just the proportion of the habitat types um, in these different landscapes, but also the the connectivity between them, the um, adjacency. So did you have riparian forest, or did you have um, you know tule or freshwater emergent vegetation next to your channel? Um, Versus, um, and also differences in, in terms of the complexity. Um, you'll see some differences in, in terms of the South Delta having a lot of local scale complexity. Um, and then also the temporal variability, which we just talked about a little bit. So um, I do want to, I think, I think um, seeing some of the, the stories and, and details about each of these landscapes um, can give you a sense of, um, on the whole, give you a sense of, of how these different um, areas um, express, express the physical gradients of the system. So um, getting to this point with the, the central delta being the place where, where tides dominate, this is perhaps the, the area that most people think of when they think of the delta. Um, you have this pattern of branching tidal channels. That's something that you don't see in the other landscapes. Um, this is where, where you have your, your typical tidal um, channel system of, of uh, branching networks that terminate within the wetlands. And uh, so, so this was a landscape that really didn't have um, a lot of topographic relief. The, the marsh plain itself was, you know, right, right there basically at high tidewater level. So you had about 200,000 acres that were... Um, Inundated about twice daily, inundated twice daily with several inches of water. So you have this high connectivity between land and water. And uh, a big part of the story, of course, were the, the numerous sinuous tidal channels that branched into the wetlands um, that, that really connected the land and water. Um, and in this photograph, I, I, I um, enjoy thinking about this because it, it was not only. Um, um, that the people were able, as, as they were starting to farm in the delta, in the central delta, um, this, this feature of, of um, the, the, tide, the ch tidal channels bringing the water under the marsh was important and valuable for, for the farmers in that they could, um, in high tides, lift up their tide gates and, and irrigate their land with fresh water and drain their land just simply by lifting their, their gates at, at uh, low tide. Um, and so, and, and I, I put in this um, aerial photo uh, photograph um, on your right, I believe, um, just to show kind of the, that local scale complexity that those small tidal channels would have brought um, to the landscape. And it wasn't just a you know a spaghetti mess of, of sinuous channels um, winding within the delta. There were really distinct patterns, and this is something that is of great interest to scientists and folks trying to design restoration plans. In that, um, the freshwater tidal wetlands in the delta, the the patterns of the tidal channels were quite different from from what you saw downstream in the brackish and saline um, wetlands downstream. Um, and so it's important to, to understand these, these networks and understand that um, 
if you're so looking at this graphic here with the darker blue being the, the main river channels, the tidal channels, uh, the main sloughs that form the islands, then understanding the pattern of how these networks branched out into, into, the, well, into the islands and terminated is an important part of the story. And they, as you can see from the graph, made up um, the majority of the length in the system. Allison, do you have any idea 